Good morning and welcome to today's Lord Mayor's Knowledge Miles Lecture on the future of employability, inspiring the next generation with Ronald Lehman, founder and CEO of Finito. I'm Charlotte Dobrashley and I'm manager of the FS Club at ZN in the City of London. And it is a great pleasure for me to introduce you to Ronald this morning. He will be providing us with a practical overview of how to achieve success in a highly competitive world by developing resilience and harnessing new technologies. Ron Al, a commentator and expert on employability, is the founder and CEO of Finito Education Limited, which supports first-time job hunters transitioning from education to employment. So he is very well placed to advise us today, whether you're seeking guidance for yourself or a young person in your community. Ronell has had a distinguished career in the City of London, having worked as a recruitment consultant, stockbroker and public relations advisor. He is also heavily involved in the voluntary sector, championing the City of London School, Noah's Ark Children's Hospice, the Griffith Institute and the University of Buckingham. Now, before I hand over to Ronald, some brief housekeeping points. The session will be recorded and available to watch on our website within 48 hours, so you may share the recording with job seekers or young people in your network. We'll also be holding a 20 minute Q&A after the presentation, so please use the GoToWebinar chat facility to send your questions in to me, and then I'll feed them into the conversation. Now, um, Ronald, the virtual floor is yours. Charlotte, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone, and, and a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for joining um, this week. I know many people are on holiday, and uh, but it is a pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, may I first pay tribute to the Lord Mayor, um, Michael Manelli, for giving me this opportunity, and to Sasha and Jacobo for helping with all the arrangements. Now, many of you, um, when you go for an interview or about to speak, will feel nervous. And it's absolutely okay to feel worried. We all do, because your adrenaline kicks in, you don't know what's going to happen next. And believe you me, it happens to even the best, whether it's a prime minister, whether it's a television presenter, whether it's a business leader, it is quite normal. But today is about the future of employability and inspiring the next generation. And we all have a role, a duty to play our part. I'm very fortunate that I've been following my passion since 2016 when I launched Finito which is to help young people find a meaningful career. And that means I don't do a day's work in my life because I'm following my passion. You try and explain that to someone who's starting out, who may have been to school, college or university. They are always thinking about the graduate programme, the opportunity that their friends and contemporaries have managed to grab. And why not them? but actually it's about your passion. What is it that you really want to do in life? So the future of employability and inspiring the next generation is about following your passion. Now I want to speak in three distinct sections, really the old ways, what happened previously when you were looking for a role, my own experience, what happened to me, which has effectively given me the chance to pursue what I want to do in life. And thirdly, where we are today and what's coming next. So the old ways, and I was thinking about this over the weekend, you know, you went to school, you had to pass your exams, that entitled you to get to the next stage to pass more exams. I was a terrible schoolboy, absolutely awful. My parents were tearing their hair out not knowing what they were going to do with me. I had two brothers, both brilliant, academically superb, now doctors. So I was effectively the black sheep of the family. But um, when I got to City of London School, age 13, everything changed. Because here is a school in the financial centre of the world that actually allowed you to become who you wanted to be. And when I went to university and then graduated with a very respectable 2-1. The world was my oyster, but there was no real careers advice in those days. Yes, there was someone who sat in a careers room with lots of brochures and documents, 
about opportunities, but nobody actually sat down and talked to you about where do you want to go? What do you want to be? And so in those days, you were really looking at advertisements, classified advertisements. In fact, I think they were called situations vacant. And you were then writing letters and you were waiting for the post. And then you may be invited to an interview and then perhaps you got rejected. Um, perhaps you wrote another letter. There was no internet. There was no immediacy. There was, there were no, nothing was quick. It all took time. Many business leaders in the city tell you that they started in the post room and then they worked their way up, getting an opportunity in sales. So um, it was about having resilience. It was about your own confidence. It was about feeling that you were somebody who could go and succeed. And that was something that we all had, which I see today is missing. My own experience was I remember getting back from university and my mother saying to me, when are you going to get a job? And it was only day two. Um, and I'd visited a recruitment firm called the IPS Group the day before, and there was a phone call that came in and it basically said, Ronell, would you like to come and work with us for a week because we need someone to make phone calls? So I put the phone down and, and um, looked at my mother and said, well, I've just been offered an opportunity. And I went to work for Trevor James at the IPS Group, which was the leading insurance and recruitment, uh, leading insurance and reinsurance recruitment group in the world. And um, it taught me everything. Um, but my real career started in stockbroking and I moved to a graduate trainee position with Scrimger Vickers. We were bought out by Citicorp, pre-Big Bang, post-Big Bang. And then I moved into financial public relations and then ran a marketing agency. But the interview process was difficult. I remember looking at investment banking, um, stockbroking and insurance. Those were the sort of three areas that I thought I would be best suited to. But the, it was the interviews that actually informed me, not the careers advice. I remember going to Casanova and arriving at their offices and being shown to this huge boardroom. There was just two of us, this very tall man. He must have been six foot six, six foot eight, towering over me. And he never smiled once during the interview. His face was really dure. And I remember thinking, this is not the place or the culture somewhere I would want to work. And although, you know, he shook me by the hand very warmly at the end, a couple of days later, I got a letter which could have been written on parchment, um, thanking me, but saying that it wasn't the place for me and they would be looking at other candidates. I was relieved. I also applied to the BBC for one of their graduate traineeships. And I got a letter rejecting me to which I famously wrote back, dear BBC, you have made a mistake, yours sincerely, Ronell Lehman. And the next day I got an invitation to come for an interview. So these are, um, you know, young people today accept rejection too easily. Uh, and that's why I started by speaking about passion, because if you have passion for something, you won't accept rejection. You will actually go and find what it is that you want to do. Let's fast forward to today. Um, now, every day we, are, we have 90 mentors. We're working with candidates who've either left school, college, university, done a master's, doctorate, or maybe even transitioning from one career to another. One of the things that we, we find is that self-confidence, self-belief, resilience is, is missing. And that is a shame. Um, it really is a shame, and it's something that we can all help um, young people to, to get on in life and show them that actually to believe in themselves is, is half the battle. Yes, you always get these CVs that are full of detail about what they've done. But the problem with the CV today is that an employer is not going to read three or four pages. It's not going to read any of it. One page is enough. And it should basically allow them to want to ask you the questions. If you give all the information, you never get the opportunity 
to be asked the questions because they know everything and they've discounted you already. So I think one of the things that um, young people are, are taught to do is to make lots of applications. We had a young lady who, who made 100 applications, never had an answer. And of course, by, by email, it's very easy. But when you actually read her email, it had no beginning, no middle, no end. It had no call to action. The CV was so populated with, with information about every job or every role that she'd ever undertaken, it wasn't of interest to an employer. So the careers advice is very poor. And we have graduates who come from really top universities and those who come from not so good universities and other institutions who perhaps had 10 minutes of careers advice in three years. And that is a shame. And I think we should all be on a mission to change that. Now, the very institutions that th these students go to are only really interested in the academic success that those students have. It's all about rankings. And once you've got your qualification, you're no longer um, of interest. The only time an alumni alumnus is ever called up is when they've succeeded in business and the institutions want your money. And that's a shame because there are lots of people who leave organizations, institutions, learning, um, learning exchanges and actually find that they're on their own. They've got nobody to actually to contact. And I think that's wrong. Now, the government is doing something about it. I'm not wishing to talk politics in this uh, discussion, but they are examining employability after three, six, nine, 12 months. So take a university, I'll spare their blushes, that has 81% employability after a year. I said to the vice chancellor, well, that means that 20%, nearly 20% of your students each year in the past five years haven't found a meaningful career. That's 100% of your students in five years. That's terrible. So we're on a mission to change that. And that's being forced by changes today in the way employers are recruiting. Everyone speaks about artificial intelligence. If you put me through an AI interview, I can tell you now I would fail. The um, bots are looking for people come from disadvantaged families who might have uh, different ethnicities, might be somebody who speaks different languages, might have a um, completely different backgrounds to the ones that perhaps you and I subscribe to. And we get rejected, even though we might be really good candidates. So diversity and inclusion is really important and leveling up and all of those uh, catchphrases which have been used time and time again, social mobility. But it does mean that people are being rejected who are perfectly good, but don't know how to deal with an artificial intelligence interview. Take an institution that maybe has 15,000 applicants. In the old days, human resources would actually be sifting through all of these, rejecting candidates. Today, the computer's doing it, and they might present them with a short list of 100. So the algorithms are set to choose the type of person that the employer is looking for, and you don't get a chance otherwise. Um, so these are challenging times for, for young people. The second thing is working from home. We had a candidate who went into the interview and the first thing he said when he was invited to ask a question was, can I work from home? And that is not what an employer wants to hear. Now, there's nothing wrong with working from home. And in fact, we've all pivoted since the pandemic. And I'll talk a bit about mental health and well-being issues. But the things that you ask at interview actually are not what the employer wants to hear. Um, so, you know, candidates need to be rehearsed. You have to prepare. Even I had to prepare for what I was going to say today. Um, I want to talk about Sir Anthony Selden, who sits on our advisory board. He wrote a book, The Fourth Education Revolution, um, and he very famously, when it was first published, said that 30% of the jobs that young people are being prepared for will not exist in the next 10 years. 
that means there's a seismic change in the way that we work and the opportunities that there will be. So I think we need to prepare uh, for those opportunities and we need to give people the chance to find out what it is that they really want. Now there are core competency tests, references are taken, people are um, uh, being checked for their health. Now the pandemic made it very, very difficult uh, for young people. Many found that their work experiences were paused. Many found that the um, graduate traineeships come back in a year. Um, but there were always those core candidates that we looked after who found ways of working, found ways of filling their time, helping people, helping people who were less fortunate than, than themselves. And that's what an employer wants to hear. They don't care whether you flunked out of university. They don't care what happened in those years. What they want to know is what did you do to overcome that adversity? One of the things that I've been working on with Siobhan Bailey, who's a member of parliament for Stroud, is to roll out something called the shadow pledge. The shadow pledge should allow anyone over the age, age of 18 to be able to follow someone in the workplace for a few hours or a day in any industry, in any trade, in any sector, and to give them the opportunity to find out what is it that they actually want to do. You know, it's no point saying I want to be a chartered accountant and then going following a, a, an accountant for a few hours and then deciding actually that's not for me. Um, but because your parents have said you need to be either an accountant, a doctor or a lawyer. You know, it's about finding out what you really want and you can't know that until you've experienced. We had a candidate who came in and sat very famously in front of one of our mentors and said, I want to be a trader. And the mentor said to him, why do you want to be a trader? And he couldn't answer the question. So the mentor responded and said, shall I help you? Is it because you've watched the film, The Big Short? That is not a good enough reason. And we arranged for him to go and sit in a commodity trading floor and a foreign exchange uh, desk for two half days. No, he didn't want to be a trader. So we've all got a, a, a role to play. But I do believe that the shadow pledge will be something that everyone can take part in and it will be welcomed by not only the institutions, the schools, the colleges, the universities that serve us well, but also inspire the next generation. Now, I know that many of you will have questions and um, I want to pause here and try and answer as many of them as I can. Thank you very much, Ronelle. We do indeed have quite a few questions. Um, so we'll get started. The um, first one you've touched on a bit already actually is from um, Shane. And he said, how do you see a major emerging technologies changing employment for the next generation? For example, AI. Yeah, well, I think, I think you can answer that very well, uh, Shane, by saying, look, just take taxi drivers. They're not going to exist in 10 years time. We will be using our smartphone and uh, we will just uh, uh, call a, a pod. And it will arrive and it will take us uh, to where we want to go. Secondly, uh, the London Underground, the tube network, the Jubilee line actually operates, can operate without drivers. We're going to see tube trains running without drivers. Now I'm using just two examples but it's going to affect every business in every sector, everywhere. Um, and you know, that, is, that is the reality today. Thank you. Clive has asked, should education concentrate on character education as much as exams? Um, well, it depends who you ask. If you ask the uh, those who are teaching, um, they will say academic excellence is the most important thing. It's the gateway, the passport to future success. I would argue that yes, academic excellence is, is a route forward, but it's not for everybody. And for that reason, I think we should be um, uh, looking at 
some of the other things that young people need to go and succeed. Resilience, self-confidence, self-belief. Um, you can have all the academic qualifications, but if you can't sit a, across the table from an employer and uh, answer questions and be calm about them um, and not nervous, not biting your nails you know, in front of them, uh, then what's, what's the use of the, the, the academic excellence? It, it's interesting because in terms of that, resil that sort of confidence and self-belief, you think that's something that's learned during childhood. So something's gone wrong there, whether it's, you know, the way children have been raised or school for the earlier education at school, um, I'm not sure, but it seems to be something that needs attention. Yes, I mean, it's very easy to blame the parents uh, or blame the school, uh, college or university. Um, certainly, I think I credit my mother uh, with giving me all the resilience I could ever want. Um, I think she still wants me to go and do a master's at Harvard. Um, so you can't win all, always. Uh, talking about interviews, um, John has asked, how do you make a good first impression at an interview? So obviously not biting your nails, um, but what, what's your advice? Um, I think the first thing is obviously, um, usually an interview will start by the prospective employer trying to put you at your ease. And so many of them will ask, well, tell me about your family. What does your brother do? What does your mother do? What does your father do? Um, and lots of candidates um, fail at that small talk right at the beginning. Um, we had one who didn't know what his, what, what, um, his, his brother did for a living. I mean, that, these are simple questions which are supposed to put you at your ease. Um, so, you know, be prepared to answer simple questions. Also, the other thing which is really important is there's going to come a moment when you are asked, um, have you got any questions for the organisation? Now, you know, the pandemic was difficult for young people, so they couldn't go and visit the office before an interview, A, to, to find out where it was, B, to make sure they arrived uh, on time. But, you know, sometimes get, we, candidates who, are, who are, are smart will go to the reception of the firm that they're going to be interviewed the next day and just talk to the receptionist and say, what's it like to work here? Or go and ask a, uh, someone who's coming out of the building and say, I, I'm, I'm interested in a, in a career. What, what's the culture like? Now, those sort of things are really important because you can feed them back um, in the interview to the prospective employer and say, well, actually, I came here a day ago, or I came here last week and spoke to a few people and I really like the culture. I find the work that you're doing here interesting. Now, you can do that also on the phone by calling up somebody and, and doing a box pop with them and saying, look, I'm a candidate. We can connect with them on LinkedIn, but show some initiative. That's all they want. They don't expect you to know all the answers. I mean, I go back to my stockbroking interview. It's a very quick story. I went in uh, after a series of other candidates and the senior partner said to me, what's the FTSE 100 today? And I replied, I don't know, but when I'm working here, I will do. And he said, thank, thankfully, I've had an honest answer. He said, the last three candidates all tried to tell me what the FTSE 100 was and they didn't know. I got the job. Now, I'm just saying, be honest, be open and um, make sure that you're prepared for the unknown. There was a candidate who was being interviewed and the fire alarm went off. Now that candidate just got out with the prospective employer, left his pad, left his phone, left everything behind and exited. The ones that didn't, because they grabbed all their personal possessions and so on, they weren't hired. Yeah, that's a that's a good one. I think the initiative um, is key as well. You can also use AI to research the company and summarize um, information for you, and even suggest questions if you want. And thing that I often do as well is um, re if you find out the names of the interviewers, you can research them before on LinkedIn, and that might make you feel more confident if you know what they look like and a bit about them. Um, 
Stephen is uh, thanking you for everything you're doing in this respect, Ronell. He's also asking on behalf of his daughter. Um, she's 14 and very worried that school is not preparing her for the world of work, work um, and employability skills are seriously lacking. So how can we fix this? Well, Stephen, it's a great question. Um, things are happening younger and younger uh, now. So people are worrying about their career earlier and earlier. I think at 14, um, your daughter will probably change her mind a few times about what she really wants to do. Um, however, the fact that she's engaging is really important and um, you should give her the opportunity to go and visit as many different organisations as is possible. Um, there will be junior career fairs at school, which are really powerful. Um, there will be opportunities for um, uh, work experience. Um, I, you know, I was very lucky. My father sent me uh, to the market age 13 in my summer holidays, the best work experience ever, which today is very difficult because of insurance, risk assessment, parental controls, you know, all of those things didn't exist in my day, but it was the best way to be able to sell, take money, speak to people, complaints. So if there's any way that your daughter can actually engage and do some voluntary work, maybe for a charity, where it's properly supervised, I would encourage you to do that. Um, we haven't talked about the, the impact of digital social media, um, but young people um, today are able to post content which makes them appear who they want to be. Um, and then, you know, they get very disappointed when they're not CEO, uh, as it might look in the photograph. So uh, well, I would just mention this because um, we had a work experience candidate who took a photograph of herself in the office and posted it with the wor words under it, I am so bored. And when personnel actually called her in and said, why have you done that? You've been given an opportunity where so many people would love that. She said, oh, I just wanted to look cool amongst my friends. I'm sure Stephen, your daughter's not like that. Um, now, Richard has said um, in his experience, many great candidates are lost through incompetent employers who don't really know what they want and accept a standard version. He um, used to train FCO fast track entrance and superficially it was very diverse, but the selection gave a group who had no diversity of thought, um, no challenge, no risk. So turning it around, what, what do we do about the employers? Uh, that's a really deep question. And um, those who don't know Fast Track, or as it's now known as Fast Stream, is, is, are those people who apply for, for the civil service. Um, I, I think as a, uh, a young person entering the workplace, you are stymied by the people that you're going to be working for. Uh, there will be those who encourage you, and there'll be those who don't. Um, and it's very important to find a mentor. I had a candidate um, the other day who said to me, oh, I don't need a mentor. And I said to him, well, why do you say that? I said, I've got mentors. I still got mentors now. I said that they're, they're the most important people in your life who help you to get on. So I think it's really important, Richard, that um, you find yourself somebody within an organization who will take you under their wing um, and help you to become the person you are. You'll be surprised how many people do this um, and it's not spoken about. Um, Richard has also asked, do we focus too much on the job, job description rather than the tasks we want them to tackle? Um, and he said, what gives them challenge and excitement? We live in a world where broad competencies are far more useful than skills associated with professions. Yes, look, job descriptions are very important because of the recruitment processes that uh, large companies have. Um, there are so many new policies that come out every day and are policy updates. Um, but at the end of the day, what an employer wants is someone who's enthusiastic, someone who can be, um, who can do and learn fast. Um, it's, you, what you don't want is someone who has no enthusiasm because you can't fire it up. Um, you know, I remember when I first went into the workplace, I was very enthusiastic and I needed dampening down. Um, it's easier for an employer to do that than the other way around. 
uh, Stephen has um, said that he's 40 and a bit anxious that maybe it's too late to change careers. What would your advice be on a career change as an older employee? Well, I definitely think you're not too old, Stephen, not at all. Well, Charlotte, I'll, I'll echo those sentiments. Uh, absolutely not. I mean, we, we work with lots of people who are transitioning. We've had very successful careers in one area and who are worried that they'll have to start right at the bottom again. And it's always easy to draw the map of a mountain and just say you jump from one peak to another peak. Um, so, Stephen, depending on your circumstances, um, there are lots of opportunities and the experience that you have will be useful to another employer. I'm in my mid 30s. I'm definitely on my second career and I imagine I will have at least four, if not more, by the time I retire. Um, Shane has asked, what's your view of people finding a job by using personal connections they have created with potential employers? Can you blame people for turning to this option when faced with the prospect of the highly competitive um, application pipeline that you described? So I live across the road from a um, senior corporate partner at Freshfields, and he told me that if his daughter wanted to go and work at Freshfields, it just wouldn't be allowed. So um, today, there are very, very strict rules about um, how uh, in introductions and, and, and um, connections are used. Um, now, we're in the financial centre of the world, and the City of London is um, you know, preeminent in people being able to make introductions and help each other. It's part of business. But the market is very regulated, and, and the bigger the firm, the bigger the corporate, um, the way in is uh, well documented and well executed. And that means that you can't just call your mate and say, can you help my son or daughter, because it doesn't work. Having said all of that, one of the ways that you can um, help your son or daughter is if they were to go and interview someone in one of those firms, and it could be um, a colleague of yours or a friend or contemporary, someone you grew up with, um, because no one is against being interviewed. Um, they will love it. And perhaps then they can write something which they can then use for making an application when they go somewhere else because they actually got some knowledge. So. I think there are ways around it without breaking rules. And many applications today are anonymous. Um, and, you know, the CV, the traditional CV, which we help prepare, sometimes we have to anonymize. Um, but someone who's enthusiastic about, you know, take someone who wants to go into private equity or someone who wants to go into investment banking or someone who wants to go into insurance, there are lots of routes in. And if you've got um, connections, by all means, use them, but do it by way of an informal discussion, not I'm looking for a job. Mm. Um, that sort of leads me to, I was thinking, it's so helpful if you have people you can talk to in your desired field to ask for advice. I'm thinking of people who say none of their family members have been to uni or worked in a um, corporate environment, so they have no idea, you know, what even you would wear to in a corporate interview or how you'd behave in an office. What um, What's your advice for people who have just no network or knowledge of their desired field? So um, we, we look after quite a few bursary students, um, who are business leaders who paid for them to come to, to Finito. I had one candidate who turned up looking really scruffy and um, I said to him, well, couldn't you have put a, a, a shirt, a tie, a jacket, at least dressed for the occasion? And he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry, I only have one shirt and I wanted to save it for a real interview. And I, I felt, felt for him right there and then and, and then promptly went and bought him a shirt. So, um, yes, you can't take these things for granted. Um, and one of the beauties about um, outreach and social mobility and engagement with people who are less fortunate is that they are even more grateful for the help that you give them. Sometimes we have candidates who come from very entitled families and um, they are the last to say thank you. That's interesting. Um, speaking of universities and student debt, what is your advice to someone who's, say, thinking of staying on at university and doing a master's, which means 
more debt rather than getting, are they better to get work experience and maybe go back to study later? I get asked this a lot. Um, if you are at, at uh, and you've just graduated, the university's job is to try and convert as many of their graduates into master's degree programs. Um, secondly, candidates who are a bit unsure about what they want to do often will say, well, I'll postpone the decision of where I work um, and do a master's. And that to me is not a good enough reason. I think if you want to, uh, to do a master's because there is a, a particular um, route that you want to go or you perhaps um, following an academia, uh, which is a, a great career as well, then by all means, but don't do it if you're just going to postpone the day of when you have to go and um, Edward um, here is asking on um, behalf of his son who's interested in completing his degree online while gaining work experience. Would this qualification be viewed differently um, than an in-person degree? Well, um, there are lots of um, uh, education models that have gone online. And um, I myself believe that face-to-face -face is what you need that experience for, for the workplace. Not everything can be done online. I mean, uh, that's not to say that he's not going to succeed and do well, but I think um, the more face-to-face -face contact that we all have, the better. And what would your, I mean, do you see this with your, um, the young people you work with, do you see that it's valuable for them to have work experience in customer service, hospitality, retail, before they go up for cor corporate jobs rather than just study? Absolutely. I mean, we have candidates who come into the office who, if you say, could you make a phone call, they want to go into a private room and do it on their own because they're not able to sit in an open room and make a phone call. I mean, that isn't really acceptable. Um, secondly, uh, I think the work experience internship or shadow placement is really important because it, it, it develops your character develops how you are seen, how you view yourself, how others look at you, and um, it, it sets you up for um, the workplace. So yes, as much ex experience that you can gain as, as possible. Well, I worked in um, call centres for years while at university, so I had to do many awful um, aggressive phone calls with angry customers in an open plan, which wasn't ideal. Um, Joanna has said that uh, she gave up her role um, as a qualified city solicitor for 25 years um, to be an advocate for solicitor apprenticeships. Um, so she's asking, do you work with school pupils as well as undergraduates? And what advice do you give to students on degree apprenticeships? Well, degree apprenticeships um, are absolutely incredible. And the 70% of all roles that you wish to pursue um, today can be done uh, so through a degree apprenticeship. And um, the government's been working very hard on it. Rob Halfen, Robert Halfen, who just recently stepped down a few days ago, has been a pioneer about the ladder of opportunity. Um, I think that um, Joanne's question is really important because firstly, anyone under 18, that you have to work around risk assessment, parental control, chaperoning. So we do help people under 18, but um, it would be online. Uh, but where the face-to-face um, -face meetings take place, it has to be with the parents or a guardian present. Um, I think that the legal profession is absolutely first class in helping people who want to go into um, either be a solicitor or a barrister um, to, to map out their careers. It's got some of the best careers advice online with firms. It's very well um, uh, run. And, uh, but certainly the, the de degree apprenticeships is, is, a, is a great route. People are looking at why should they spend so much at, at the university run up debt. Um, university degree is not a passport to future success. And if you can get started earlier, why not? Yeah, that's great advice. Um, John has asked, um, what do you say about teaching young graduates to own their mistakes at work? Let me tell you, I've made many mistakes. The important thing is not to repeat them. 
and do you advise them to be you know up front and say they've made a mistake before trying to cover it up and creating so, more there's no, there's no point you know we're all human you know mistakes happen um you know look in, in business you can proof check something a hundred times now charlotte i don't want to embarrass you but my surname's got two ends you know mistakes happen but it's okay you know um sorry about that um <laughs> i yeah i think we've got time for one more question um i mean it's a quick fire if there are any others just i'll quickly go through them cool. this is uh quite a long one so uh thanks for your from charles thanks for your talk and discussion it seems that a starting point is knowing what you would like to do in your working life. Um, in the old fashioned sense, being asked what you want to do when you grow up. But as you say, the work landscape is changing fast. Um, he remembers over his work um, life before retiring, finding out about a lot of opportunities he was completely ignorant of when at university. So how do people find out about what opportunities are available? Well, I think, um answer that with look we're at the age where you can know anything you can read about anything digital social media is you know informing you so the the, the opportunity to learn and find out about opportunity about the careers or the futures future opportunities are there they're limitless you cannot abdicate responsibility to a careers advisor to a mentor to find you what it is that you want in life what you can do is rely on their good guidance, on their knowledge, their experience, the experience of hundreds and thousands of other candidates, which they may have worked with in the past, to help centre you and ground you to find out what you might be best suited for. But the idea that um, you can't yourself uh, find out what you want um, with a bit of help, um, I, would, I would hazard to say that's not true. Thank you. Um, well, we are out of time now, but I will mention that we've put the link to the Finito World magazine in the chat there. And I understand um, that you can sign up following that link and um, the magazine is free. Is that is that correct? Absolutely. Sorry, yes, I didn't the employees are employed magazine in difficult times. So if you'd like to receive it, it would be a, a pleasure to send it to you. Fantastic. So I'd encourage you all to do that. Uh, lots of comments coming in saying thank you very much for um, giving such helpful answers and thank you very much for your time. It's been um, really, really interesting um, chatting with you and sharing your time and expertise with us today, I'm sure has been really valuable for lots of people. Um, and thank you everyone for logging in um, and connecting with us virtually and contributing to the discussion. We do have more uh, Knowledge Mail lectures coming up over the coming weeks on a variety of topics, which you can register for um, on the website there, knowledgemiles.net. So thank you everyone and have a great short week ahead. Goodbye.